Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're going to actually uh, discuss a topic that's uh, quite a bit different uh, than a lot of topics that uh, you know VMworld. Um, it's a new and emerging field, AI ML. So kind of do that context switch in your mind. Um, so my name is Mazar Memon, uh, director of engineering at uh, at VMware. Uh, previously, I was CTO, co-founder at uh, Bitfusion, and uh, Bitfusion is uh, sort of the technology we're going to talk about today. So, um, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, Bitfusion, the really the problem, a really important emerging problem that's happening today, and uh, talk about how Bitfusion solves that, and then um, we'll go into um, kind of the future of hardware acceleration uh, that's happening. We'll give you a demo. And then also talk about how that integrates into vSphere. So first of all, let me just give you an overview of what Bitfusion is. Right? So Bitfusion is a software layer that uh, is in user space under the application that provides virtualization capabilities and optimizes for AI, for AI infrastructure. So these are like GPUs, um, you know, uh, FPGAs that are coming as well. So let me talk about a little bit about um, AI and machine learning. So these are emerging workloads that are quite a bit different than uh, what most people are used to, right? So number one, um, there's not a lot of programming here uh, anymore, right? It used to be several years ago where people wanted to, let's say, build a self-driving car or do object recognition or uh, you know do uh, you know character recognition for the post office, right? That these were things that uh, programmers actually coded for, right? They tried to find patterns, they applied some uh, statistical formulas, and then they were able to kind of, uh, you know, detect these, these objects and, and, and um, kind of do automate human cognition, right? Over the years, you know, that's become uh, much more complex. Um, you know, when you're talking about uh, doing language translation or, uh, you know, driving a car, this is a very, uh, this is a very um, complex behavior uh, that humans do uh, normally. And um, so people have built libraries, frameworks, additional layers of abstraction. And nowadays you have this construct of auto ML, which is that as long as you have enough data, you can actually train this model to do uh, a really wide variety of, of tasks. So, you know, in the end, um, there's less and less programming. Which is, which is very interesting. Um, in most application development, um, you know, the developer is thinking about infrastructure, how many CPUs do I have, how much memory am I using, how much disk am I using, and in this space, it's becoming less and less so. Uh, the developer is several degrees removed from the actual infrastructure. That's challenge number one. Second challenge is that um, in developing these models, uh, typically there's a lot of iteration using let's say CPUs, uh, just general processors, uh, to do some experimentation, um, developing and testing, and then moving to training, which typically uses GPUs, larger machines, um, and a, lot of, a large number of machines. So typically you're going from small infrastructure to large infrastructure back and forth. And that's also typically, that's not what you commonly find in uh, applications today. So that's challenge number two. Um, and challenge number three is just like uh, big data, this is extremely data intensive and compute intensive, right? And it, it's to the point that um, architectures today, compute architecture today, just don't cut it. And this is what I mean. This is, you know, at, at the infrastructure level, things are changing, right? So you guys are familiar with Moore's Law, uh, the end of Moore's Law. Um, you know, you can look at the economic benefits have ended. Uh, per, per performance per watt has slowed, um, and you know a lot of a lot of the benefits of Moore's law has, has ended uh, several years ago. And the important thing as a result of that is that um, it drives the entire industry to generate a specialized architecture for, for spe specific tasks. So if you have vision, you're going to have a vision processor. So if you have audio, you're going to have audio processors, etc. And so you have this massive explosion of big tech giants and a bunch of startups um, developing their own ASICs, their own custom chips. And the way I look at it is back in the day, you used to have the area of, uh, era of single core. A single core would become faster and faster every year. 
uh, through um, you know fast higher frequencies, you know one, two, five, ten gigahertz, and then you had the era of multi-core when uh, that stopped, and the era of many-core, many-core processors, and then sort of the the era of class-specific cores, and they put you know GPUs and FPGAs and, and DSPs in that category, where they're not exactly uh, application specific, but um, they are specific to a class of uh, of algorithms, right? Now what you see, um, you know, this year, and you'll see this more and more next year and the following years, is what I call the era of AI cores. A massive explosion of companies that are, you know, building and developing their own uh, chips. So just think about what this means. Hardware is becoming way more specialized, way more complex, and what we just saw is AI development is, is very abstract, right? So you have this widening void that we have to solve. And if we rewind and you look at today, what is the problem? Um, infrastructure, the way people uh, use GPUs today, um, is very inefficient. So number one, you have different kinds of GPUs, some that do inference well, some that do training well. Um, and they are segmented, they're part of a, a data center. Uh, very few people can figure out how to use them effectively um, in many different levels, right? How, how do you get more than one user to effectively use um, a GPU server, right? We've actually seen some people, um, you know, schedule a GPU server in Outlook, right? How do you get multi-tenant use of, of servers? How do you schedule them? That doesn't exist today. Second thing is, even if you could get two users on the same machine, um, how do you partition the machine in such a way that you can get isolation between the two users? And the third problem is even if you get dedicated access to a GPU, most applications won't make 100% use of that very expensive resource. And um, these new servers are actually an order of magnitude more expensive. You know, uh, they can be on the order of half a million dollars just for for U box, right? Um, and the sad thing is, utilization is very low. So the state of affairs when it comes to infrastructure is, is pretty dire, right? So the way we see it is um, virtualization is really a key um, part of the solution, right? Virtualization solves, you know, sharing, multi-tenancy. Uh, you can pack, uh, com you know, uh, complementary workloads together and get higher utilization. You can also get, make um, these uh, specialized compute uh, resources much more accessible, right? You don't have to install drivers necessarily. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of migration. Uh, so it makes uh, just ease of use uh, much higher, right? Um, the, the challenge here, though, is that sort of conventional virtualization, um, you know, hypervisor type or device vir uh, type virtualization has several dr drawbacks and doesn't really solve all of the problems that exist in sort of the AI machine learning workload space, right? Number one, um, it's, it's not dynamic enough, right? So applications want to be able to grab a resource, use it for several seconds and then release it. Another application may use uh, a resource, it may use it for a day and then release it, right? It's highly dynamic, highly bursty, and uh, we need to accommodate that uh, because that resource is so expensive. Um, Typically, if you, if you think about changing hardware resources on a VM, uh, typically you'll need to shut down that VM, you know, change the, the resource allocation, more memory, more storage, et cetera, and then rest restart it, right? This needs to be a little bit more dynamic for compute. Um, and, and again, when you talk about iteration between dev test and training, we're using small compute sometimes. In another few minutes, you're using a large uh, amount of hardware resources. We need to be able to switch back and forth very, very fast, right? So those are kind of uh, the challenges of uh, virtualization today. And so the approach, sort of the BitFusion approach is to introduce virtualization, but actually go up stack. So let me tell you what that means. So typically you have hardware here, right? Um, and above that you have a hypervisor, and then you have an operating system and drivers, and then you have uh, you know, libraries that support applications, right? So typically, um, if you introduce virtualization to hypervisor like it is today, um, it's very general, right? You can apply your hypervisor to a, a, a large variety of hardware, um, and uh, it, it, as far as what you can run, it's really specific to, you know, the VMs that you run, right? Very, very general. The downside is that if you look at kind of the interaction of um, I.O. from the application to the hardware, there's millions of IOs per second, 
right? And uh, the latency sensitivity uh, is very high, right? So you have um, not as much opportunity to, to optimize. Um, you have less opportunity to disaggregate resources. Um, and so that's where kind of the challenges of the hypervisor level. If you take the other extreme and you introduce virtualization at the application level, well, this is great in that you have a lot of opportunities to, to optimize. Um, you don't see millions of interactions per second. You typically see hundreds of uh, I.O. interactions per second, um, which is very manageable. Um, it's not as latency sensitive, right? It, it's uh, much more elastic, um, and the scaling can be high, right? At the highest, uh, you know, scaling is really at the application level, whatever could be achieved there. The downside is you're very application specific. So if you imagine, uh, you know, having a distributed application, the distribution that you've implemented for the application is specific to the application. You can't take it and like port it to some other application. It's, it's very application specific, which, which is a problem. Um, in this space, and, and MLs, there's many, many frameworks. It's really an explosion of libraries. A lot of people are innovating. It's very chaotic. Um, and so you, you will not be able to introduce virtualization generally across a lot of applications if you, uh, you know, go at the application level. So what we found is there's actually an interesting sweet spot, uh, which is at the API level. So um, at the API level, interactions are manageable. Uh, you know, latencies are, are manageable. And you have a good amount of generality, right, which is, which is really important. So in this sweet spot is where we introduce virtualization capabilities. What we normally uh, are kind of used to in hypervisor, introduce some of those capabilities at this layer, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, so you can, you, it's highly dynamic. Um, you can actually assign resources at the application, per application. Different applications can get different, uh, you know, uh, resource allocations. Um, and you can start and stop those uh, as and when the application starts and stops. And so that's where Bitfusion, this virtualization layer, has been introduced. And so uh, this is kind of a busy slide, but the way to think about it is you have the application that is, uh, and we have a Bitfusion layer that is intercepting part of this application. So if you think about uh, a certain API uh, that we intercept CUDA, which is, which is the most popular uh, compute API used in AI and ML today. We intercept CUDA every API call, and we are able to manipulate and change the way that uh, that API behaves with respect to the application. So there's a lot of stuff uh, going on here, right? We can actually take that API call, and we can send it over the network, and we can send it to the other side. It gets executed on the, the server where the actual hardware resources are, the GPUs. The GPU will process that, return a value and then comes back to the application. And so to make that fast, there's a lot of optimizations that we employed, uh, caching, automatic uh, pipelining, um, and uh, to make this fast, very latency insensitive, and there's a lot of potential complexity here, right? So you have this application, it's actually using uh, a lot of resources in the, in the data center potentially, and uh, there's a lot of optimizations that are, that are employed here, right? But to the application view, it's very simple. Application simply runs, and it just sees that there's a pool of resources um, as if it was directly connected to the, to the local box, and it just runs. Um, there's no recompilation required. It's all uh, binary uh, interception, and uh, it's very clean uh, from the application's point of view. No changes are necessary. And so if you put, put this all together, if you think about kind of the capabilities that uh, this Bitfusion technology <coughs> offers is, number one, we're able to um, do something very similar to like network attached storage, network attached AI, or network attached coprocessors, right? Where we can have a stack or a, a bunch of rack of these accelerators, GPUs, FPGAs, AI, ASICs, and then attach them to normal commodity uh, CPU servers as and when they're needed. And this could be done over ethernet, uh, VMX Net3, uh, Rocky InfiniBand, et cetera, right? So this is, this is a very similar story to disaggregated storage, right? And we're applying the same techniques, the same analogies to uh, compute. And this is why, um, you know, it, it's um, very, very uh, useful, uh, this analogy, because a lot of the same economic benefits you get from storage, now we can apply to uh, compute. 
The second capability is uh, hardware partitioning, where we can take uh, these expensive resources, GPUs, and arbitrarily partition them. You know, an application doesn't necessarily need to use 100% of, you know, a $1,000 GPU. It can maybe use 13%, it could use 50%, et cetera. And so we're able to segment uh, these resources very in a fine-grained uh, way, attach, uh, you know, allocate that to an application. Application uses just that amount of GPUs, freeing that up for other users uh, to, to make use of them. And of course, the third part is uh, the analytics. Uh, whenever you introduce virtualization, people would automatically, you know, after they start using, they start to scratch their head and say, exactly how is my infrastructure being used? How many users are there? Uh, you know, what is my utilization like, right? And so, um, since we're at a very unique part of the stack, we can get very interesting analytics, right? How much memory are they being used? How much, uh, you know, core utilization is there? Which users, right? What times? And so, dashboard and analytics are also an important uh, component. So, kind of summarizing, um, this virtualization layer at you know, user space and the application level um, can introduce all these new virtualization capabilities. Dynamic remote attach, which is the ability to, the, the application can go out, grab a GPU as if it was local connected, run, and then uh, you know, unattach it. Um, memory partitioning, this idea that you can part, uh, partition just uh, how much of the hardware resources you need to use. And, and third is that um, since you've disaggregated this compute, you can start pooling them together. So you can have this like large rack of GPU servers, extremely expensive, and then have a much higher uh, ratio of users to, uh, to GPUs, right? Um, and it's really important that this runs in user space. It's extremely portable, um, you know, so, and, and it's fairly secure, right? You get process isolation, memory isolation, and it runs anywhere, containers, VMs, et cetera and completely transparent, zero change to the application.